The world of digital watches and its now 50 year plus history is a beast to unravel for the uninitiated. On the Illuminating Watches channel I've been shining a light into the corners of this hobby for a while and this video consolidates all that insight into a rapid fire format that can be fired directly into your brain. I can't cover everything, this is simply you taking that initial red pill. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Now the digital watch era kicked off in the US with the Pulsar time computer range. The US played a central role in LED watch production, Fairchild Semiconductor and Hughes Aircraft being the leading manufacturers, with US partners producing a huge variety of models and collaborations with renowned Swiss brands like Longines under the Vitnau brand and other players making their mark here were Hewlett Packard with the LED calculator watch and brands like Electronics. It was Optel, a US based company that originated the first LC watches, their dynamic scattering mode display watches based on provisional research at RCA Labs caught the attention of classic American brands like Waltham with their Walcron series amongst many others. Now Microma, which was an offshoot of Intel and Texas Instruments renowned for developing the integrated circuit, also joined the DSM display game in collaboration with Longine and ESA on this Clepsidra and it was Gruen and that introduced the first twisted Lomatic LCD which is the basic display tech for most digital watches, but it was the US company Elixco founded by James Ferguson that provided the groundbreaking technology for Gruen's Teletime, although there is some politics here with the discovery by Roche at the same time of the same technology. Timex, a US stalwart with Norwegian roots, showcased some basic digital models in the 70s like the SSQ and Q Timex range. Bulliver, impressed with their striking LEDs like the Big Block and Computron, later launching the super thin Bulliver Phantom. Armatron entered the game with their own LED timepieces, as did National Semiconductor, my favourite being their scientific calculator. Notably, Real Electronics brought us the innovative Synchrona watch powered by solar technology. While the US embraced LEDs, the Japanese took the lead pushing LCD innovation further forward. Seiko swiftly entered the market with the 06LC, followed by multifunction digital watches like the 0634. They gained pop culture prominence through appearances in James Bond films with the inclusion of the 0674 and the Memory Bank LC. Seiko's World Time M158 Pan Am and the A239 World Map became iconic timepieces. Citizen, another Japanese powerhouse, entered into the market in 1974, the LC9010, and they soon introduced the world's first digital watch with an alarm, the Christron LC, and pioneered LCD calculator watches. We can't overlook Casio, who, although a little bit behind Seiko and Citizen, made a leap from calculator watches watches in 1974 with their original QW02 Casiotron and over time they adopted features to their range including world time in 1976. However it was in the late 70s when Casio truly showcased the seeds of their evolved form with the introduction of the first plastic digital LCD watch, the classic F100. Whilst many forget their contributions, Orient was a major player in the digital watch field during the 70s. Their range including the 6200, 64100 and 66000 competed well on quality and presence. They even dealt into LED watches and were early adopters of solar and calculator watches. Notably, Orient had the world's first music alarm watch. Though their prominence waned in the 80s, they did manage to create a few additional hits, such as the 75100 memory alarm and the 7700 sound monitor. Ricoh, often overlooked and associated with printers and photocopiers, made significant contributions as well. They offered cool LEDs, straight ahead LCD watches, and Anadigis. The Crown Controlled 827 watch and the Alarm Chrono Calendar model are personal favourites. Similarly, Sanyo breached out from consumer goods to digital watches. While we may associate Switzerland primarily with the traditional luxury mechanical watch market, they did have a digital watch presence in the 70s, and some of their offerings were undeniably cool. Omega launched the Time Computer, the Chrono Quartz, and a digital version of the Speedmaster. Hoyer, fueled by Jack Hoyer's enthusiasm for electronics, made a significant impact with their awesome Chrono Split, featuring dual displays. Sikora were innovators with their 1976 Superman watch, harnessing kinetic technology, and the solar-powered VIP2000. A recent discovery of mine has been Satina's digital watch range, and other Swiss brands like Tissot, Girard Perigo, JLC, Longines, Mundane, Mido, Enicar, and Rado also left their mark with their own digital timepieces. Digital watches were a symbol of competing on the world stage of electronics innovation, prompting other countries to join the race. Even the USSR had the Electronica 1 LED watch, followed by the Electronica 5 range, which originated from what is now modern-day Belarus. Eastern Germany showcased their desire to have homegrown options in this area that was a symbol of advancement with Ruler and Pursuta digital watches. Meanwhile, West Germany excelled in solar technology with Crystallonic and other brands like Arctos, Degena, Meister 
Baker, MBO and Braun who made their mark with their distinctive design language. Even Britain added their touch with the Sinclair Black Watch. Hey Mikey, I think he likes it. How about some more? Hell yes. In the 80s, Timex made a triumphant surge, resurfacing from their failed computing adventures with Sinclair, defeated by the Commodore. Their marathon range had some limited popularity, but they had a step change with the Timex Triathlon, ultimately tying it to the Ironman event. Their success continued with the release of the Atlantis and a range of sports-focused watches such as the Skiathlon, Velotrack, Brave Wave, Victory and Hooks. Armatron also maintained their presence with their all-sport range, focusing mainly on American sports. Among the newer US entrants, Nelsonic carved out a niche for themselves in the game watch market, licensing various IPs from the arcade gaming industry, and Watchman and GCE followed in a similar vein. Surf enthusiasts had a favourite in freestyle, known for their Velcro-strapped shark models, which are still growing strong today. Seiko remained a major force in the 80s, penetrating popular culture with the Ana Digi range. Models like the H127, H249, H239, View to a Kills, H558, and H461 became key highlights. Different display technologies became a focal point and we saw iconic watches like the 1980 G757 with its striking design relatively recently revitalised under the Wired brand and links to Metal Gear Solid. Dot Matrix displays made their entrance with models like the D031 and D138 Running Man. Sports applications were clear with watches like the S229 Pulse Meter and the S234 with chest strap. One of my all time favourites from Seiko incorporated a rotary switch bezel. Watches like the Astronaut worn many times in space, the Yacht Timer, the Training Timer featured in Back to the Future, and the Giugiaro Design Speedmaster are personal favourites of mine. Seiko also impressed with their technological focus, introducing the first TV watch and various iterations of computer watches like the UC2000, RC4000 and RC4500. To provide more affordable options, Seiko launched the Alba, Loris and Pulsar brands. The 80s truly marked Casio's rise to the dominating force in the digital watch landscape. They introduced iconic watches like the Melody Alarm in 1982 and the calculator watch for the masses, which evolved into the more complex databank series. Casio was quick to explore gaming watches and placed a strong emphasis on sports watches, catering to jogging and swimming enthusiasts. They also led the way in sensor watches, introducing models like the Alti Depth, the BM100 Barometer and Depth Gauge. Notably, Casio released the revolutionary G-Shock in 1983, later launching the G-Shock 2 with mud-resistant buttons. Citizen 2 remained a strong contender in the 80s, their signature offering rings revolved around Digi Anna watches, starting with models like the 8900, 8911, 8940, 8943 and the 8970. They ventured into pseudo-analog watches with the 9560 and Citizen's innovation extended into sensor technology, introducing the world to the Anna Digi Temp with inbuilt temperature sensor in 1982. They further explored the realm of depth sensors with the Aqualan C020 in 1985. Sporting enthusiasts had their fair share of options such as the Pacemaker 9500 9590 and D010, with the C-Shock, as one subscriber described it, being an attempt to compete with the G-Shock. Citizen also offered cycling, running and skiing shock sensor watches. Technological advancements didn't escape Citizen's attention either, leading to the introduction of the Anadigi voice memo in 1985, the amazing VX2 voice master and the cool looking radio watch called the Citizen Soundwich. The Swiss were still in the digital watch game in the 80s, Omega showcased the Equinox with a JLC Reverso style function, the sensor quartz with touchscreen capability and the Seamaster multifunction. Meanwhile, the iconic Breitling Aerospace made its debut during this era and one of my personal favourites from the Swiss offerings is the Memesail LCD Regatta Watch. Why am I, I sir? You've never used them before. Timex had a major hit again in the 90s with the launch of their Indiglo electroluminescent technology that revolutionised the backlight from the weaker LED bulb option and applied it to their Iron Man and Atlantis range, as well as new models like the Reef Gear and Humvee collaboration. Timex would partner with Microsoft to develop the data link that used light beams and sensors to exchange information between computers and the watch, with it being approved for use in space. Casio continued their innovation incorporating graphical displays, speed focus features and even blood pressure monitoring 
They explored wrist remotes, detection of incoming phone calls, role-playing games, and punch and kick force detection. Casio also garnered attention with their dual-layer LCD twincept technology. Building on from their initial foray into sensor watches, Casio would double down in the 90s, completing the range of sensors with the Alti Thermo ALT6000 and CPW100 with magnetic compass, which would all come together in the triple sensor watch with pressure, temperature, and terrestrial magnetism sensors, with the ATC1100, which would later be branded as the ProTrek range. The 90s would be capped off with the amazing first use of GPS in a watch with the satellite Navi PRT-1GPJ. Within their G-Shock range, Casio expanded beyond the iconic square design, introducing models like the Three Eyes and the Jason series. They also targeted professionals with their Masters of G range, featuring watches like the Mudman, Frogman, Riseman, Gaussman, Fisherman, Lungman, Revman, Golfman, Wademan, and Raysman. Seiko, still a relevant but slightly fading player in the 90s digital watch game, focused on technological innovations and niche sports options. Their Ski Thermo S820, cross training watches, and Scuba Master collection were high quality options. Seiko even dabbled in message watches, utilizing pager technology and radio control capabilities with the SBJK003 model. Among their offerings, the H Time Tron stood out to me with its teletext style graphics. Seiko also tapped into youth fashion with the Alba Spoon, capturing the spirit of extreme sports culture. India was a little late to the party after missing out on the chance to get in on digital watches early, but the 90s would finally see some presence with HMT having their Astra range, but it would be Titan watches that were ultimately the more successful export that are still a significant player today. Look out that window. You had your time. The future is our world. The 2000s was when Seiko continued their limited attention on their youth focus ranges, including Alba, Loris, particularly the Fusion range, and Pulsar, with Citizen continuing on with their independent range with increasingly out there choices. The popularity of this segment attracted new players like Nixon, who introduced watches tied to skate culture like the Dork, voiced by Tony Hawk. Another Japanese-oriented brand, Tokyo Flash, emerged in the 2000s, focusing on LED technology and presenting unique time-telling methods that often required a bit of deciphering with other Japanese companies like Sea Hope existing in the same ecosystem. There were some glimmers of innovation through this though. Ventura, known for the cool The Watch designed by Fleming Bohansen, introduced the Spark Watch in 2000, utilizing technology similar to Seiko's now forgotten Kinetic Tech, and Swatch tried an interesting concept with their internet time with their beat range. Most of the rest of the world had largely faded into the background at most repackaging Hong Kong based modules where they were participating, but a rare exception was in the field of radio controlled watches with Germany's Young Hands developing the Young Hands Mega One. It would be Japan's Casio in the 2000s though that really doubled down on the use of radio control within the digital watch space, initially with the Germany only FKT range, but more prominently with the Antman watch, so called because of his Ant Ni, that big block on the side. They would be even more tech focused with the MP3, wrist camera and contactless payment options. From the 2010s onwards we find ourselves at the cusp of the smartwatch era, where digital watches intersect with more advanced technologies. Casio for instance embraced Bluetooth connectivity and launched the G-Squad range, display technologies like MIP or memory and pixel took center stage more recently, and Seiko had already been an early adopter of e-ink style displays with the Active Matrix e-ink SDGA, while brands like Pebble Watch utilized the other e-paper technologies. Casio continued to cater for enthusiasts with their expanding G-Shock line, including the long-awaited introduction of the Metal G-Shock model. They released even bolder looking watches like the Rangeman, Golfmaster, and Mudmaster within the Master of G-Series, and Seiko remained highly specific with their digital watches, introducing models like the Prospects Fieldmaster, Digital Alpinist, and Digital Tuner SBEP-023. ProTrek, Casio's line for outdoor adventurers, faced some stiff competition from the likes of Garmin and Sunto, but continued in their commitment to the segment, including their own smartwatch. Timex was still around in the 2010s, capitalizing on their Ironman triathlon range by incorporating GPS and smartwatch features. The retro-styled T80 evoked a sense of 80s nostalgia, with nods to Pac-Man and Space Invaders amongst others. In an effort to compete with the G-Shock, Timex introduced the Command series, while Nixon ventured into the same territory with their Regulus watch. Armatron, primarily targeting the US market, continued to play a role, finding recent success with their retro options, particularly the Griffey LED. China-based brands like Skmi gained loyal followings, and Autodromo's Group C collection inspired by Group C Racing caught my attention recently as well when it was featured in Hodinkee, and the 
model of a Computron has also been revived, which alongside the retro fashion train that Casio continues to ride has been breathing some life into the market. Looking ahead, the future of digital watches is a little bit bleak as things go more down the smartwatch route, but there is still opportunity for revitalization and innovation, fueled by nostalgia for the past and the desire for new technological advancements that aren't connected into the matrix. If you want to carry on down the rabbit hole, you may enjoy my technological advancement focus history in the video on screen now.